Hello, I'm Lenore Mowney from the Hoover Institution. Hoover Fellows Terry Moe and Eric Hanischek, who are members of Hoover's CRET Task Force on K-12 Education, met to talk about Terry's latest book, Liberating Learning. In this new book, Terry and his co-author, John Chubb, look at ways in which America's schools should take advantage of new technology to enhance learning. Terry, I'm pleased to be here to talk about your new book on technology and education. It has an intriguing title, Liberating Learning. Where does that come from? Well, in part, uh, the title has to do with the great benefits that technology has to offer for education. You know, we're in the midst of a historic revolution in information technology that is literally transforming human society all over the world. And it just can't help but have profound implications for the way students learn. Could you sketch a little bit about how that could be beneficial? Well, through programs of online learning, um, coursework can actually be customized to the individual student. Um, kids can uh, get instant feedback on uh, how well they're doing. They can get remedial help on material that they don't understand. They can uh, move through the material at their own pace and uh, um, uh, take their coursework at their own schedule any time of the day or night. Uh, and they can take a vast array of courses, uh, all sorts of different uh, kinds of courses at different levels um, that their own schools and their own districts uh, can't possibly provide them. So whether, you know, whether the kids are living in Detroit or in Appalachia or anywhere, they can have access, however limited their own schools are, to the very best that the world has to offer. It's incredibly exciting. And especially when you compare it to the traditional model of American education, where you have, you know, 25, 30 students sitting in a classroom, listening to a teacher talk, and being taught a standardized curriculum, right, that's aimed at the average student. So you have a lot of kids who don't understand it and who fall behind. There are other kids who do understand it and would like to move ahead. They can't. They're frustrated. They're bored. And so... Uh, a system that allows education to be customized to each student, regardless of whether they're slow learners, fast learners, whatever, is just uh, a, a true advance in uh, how we approach student learning. Well, that, that sounds intriguing, and obviously for uh, an education that helped my own kid do what he or she should do well seems good, but could that be economical to do that? Um, absolutely. I mean, for the first time in modern history, um, what this means is that we can use technology to enhance productivity in education. I mean, throughout the private economy and throughout history, technology has been the engine that drives productivity. But it's never had any impact at all on education, which has remained unproductive and in fact gotten more and more unproductive over time. So for the first time in modern history, we're able to substitute technology for labor in education. And technology is really cheap. Labor is very expensive and getting more expensive all the time. And so this allows us to use our scarce resources uh, in much more productive ways in the future and provide kids with a much more uh, 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 well, a much higher quality education for the same amount of money. Well, this has a little bit of a ring of a sci-fi book here where the computers take over and the teachers and the human element is taken out of the schools. Uh, well, I don't think it's really going to be like that, uh, basically because uh, people don't want that. Uh, we think that uh, in the future, uh, the typical child will go to school, just like today, uh, but the school will tend to be a hybrid school that blends the traditional elements with the high-tech elements. So there will still be um, lots of face-to-face -face interaction. There will be sports. There will be clubs and so on. Uh, but kids will take uh, most, uh, maybe even all, of their academic training on the computer, right? So it will be a mix. And I think people will tend to get different mixes um, depending upon what they want. This sounds like a vision that I've heard before where technology does things better than the normal classroom. And yet every time I look in schools, they don't seem much different than the schools I went to a long time ago. Uh, what's going on? Well, this is the other side of the equation. Uh, precisely because technology is so transformative, 
uh, and can really change the fundamentals of education, it's threatening uh, to the established groups that run the, the existing system. These groups are really powerful in politics and they're resisting it. Uh, now, by far, the most powerful of these groups are the teachers' unions, and they've been using their formidable power in the political process to block the advance of technology. Well, I don't quite understand why it's so threatening to these teachers. It seems to be something that makes their job easier. Well, bottom line, it's about jobs and money. You know, the substitution of technology for labor really means that we'll need fewer teachers per student in the schools. And the unions are concerned first and foremost with job protection. So this is very threatening to them. Also, when you have students in a district that can take a lot of their courses uh, virtually, and so can be taking them from teachers that are out there uh, anywhere, really, and schools that are anywhere, then uh, the jobs and the money tend to go to these places and away from the regular uh, schools where unionized teachers teach. And so this, too, is very threatening to districts and very threatening to, uh, to uh, teachers' unions. And their response is to try to block it, try to control it and contain it so that it actually doesn't transform uh, the schools. Now, are the unions really that strong? Can they really block things? Absolutely. They've been doing it for the past quarter century. Um, uh, ever since uh, a nation at risk warned of a rising tide of mediocrity in our schools and our policymakers have been desperately trying to improve the quality uh, of schools over the years, um, uh, the reforms that they've pursued, major reforms, you know, real accountability, real choice for parents and students, um, efforts to get bad teachers out of the classrooms have been undermined and weakened and gutted from the beginning. And uh, the reason is these things are threatening to the unions. The unions are really powerful. And here we are, it's 2009, and reformers are still trying to reform the schools. Why? Because we haven't achieved much of anything over the past quarter century. All the major efforts have been blocked. So I've read a lot of your past articles and books on this subject, and they always end with the story that the blocking actually occurs. Why is technology different? Well, a big uh, theme of our book is that technology is different. Um, technology isn't really a reform like the others. Uh, technology is this massive social force uh, that's transforming human society all over the world. And it sort of infuses everything and can't be kept out of the schools completely. And as it seeps in, right, it starts to have a variety of consequences that are uh, uh, totally unintended um, that actually tend to undermine the power of the unions. Um, so, for instance, when technology is substituted for labor in order to make the schools more productive and to provide a better education for kids, we have fewer teachers per student and fewer union members per student. Well, this is really bad for the union. Suddenly, their membership is going to start declining and that's going to have a big effect on their power. Right? Also, when students start taking online courses uh, from teachers who are somewhere else, right? it doesn't matter where the teachers are, then the, the teaching profession as a whole will tend to be more dispersed and fewer of them will be concentrated in districts. Well, it's that very concentration that's made them easy to organize by unions. And so over time, as teachers become more dispersed, the unions are going to have a much harder time organizing teachers. And so for these and other reasons, all of which sort of work together, um, uh, union power is going to tend to ebb over time. It won't totally go away, but it's going to be significantly lower in the future than it is now. You discussed the organization of the unions itself, but if their power goes down, what does that mean for U.S. education? Well, you know, big picture, this is really what we mean by the liberation of learning. Because once the unions aren't able to block reforms, then all these technological innovations are going to tend to go through. And technology really can transform the schools. It won't be blocked. Um, more than that, real accountability, real school choice, getting bad teachers out of the classroom, um, pay for performance. All these reforms that have been blocked or eviscerated over the years 
can start to flow through because they're not going to be blocked. So, you know, most generally what's going to happen is that for the first time in modern history, this nation can really put kids first and do what makes sense for kids and for schools and for quality education in its attempt to make the schools better. And in the end, that's what the liberation of learning is really all about. Terry, you and John Chubb have put together a really intriguing picture of the future. Uh, I look forward to linking your projections in the book to the future. Thank you very much. Enjoyed it.